Welcome back to my channel and Happy New Year, everybody. In this video, we'll be discussing the difference between Tylenol versus NSAIDs, which is like a sports rivalry, but in the clinical world. They are readily available in our local pharmacies, and we tend to use them a lot in hospital settings to reduce the use of opioids. In this video, I will cover the main differences between them and discuss their mechanisms. Please like the video if you end up learning anything from it. It helps with the YouTube algorithm so it can show up for others. Thank you. Now, Tylenol is also known as acetaminophen, paracetamol, or an acetaminophen paraaminophenol, also known as APAP. Now, some of the common NSAIDs we have are ibuprofen, naproxen, aspirin, and celecoxib, which I have in a different color because it's a selective inhibitor, and the ones listed above it are all non-selective inhibitors. We will learn more about this as we go. Now, when we think of Tylenol and NSAIDs, we think of using them for pain, inflammation, well, let's dive deeper into the pathophysiology of all this. Inflammation occurs when your body gets exposed to foreign agents such as bacteria, toxins, or from an injury. When this happens, the body tries to fix the problem by recruiting your immune cells to the site, leading to the release of substances that can cause vasodilation, clotting, increased permeability, etc. Prostaglandins will be the focus of today because of the drug mechanisms. Now, your body does all of these with good intentions, but unfortunately, the symptoms we get because of this is not that good. We usually present with a fever, redness, swelling, or pain. Now keep in mind that prostaglandins are a significant part of why all of this happens. Production of prostaglandins begin when the inflammatory response is initiated. In that case, arachidonic acid, which is usually found in the cell membrane, gets converted by cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2 enzymes. Arachidonic acid converted by cyclooxygenase 1 leads to prostaglandins and thromboxane, which are responsible for inflammation and protection of the stomach lining and also platelet formation. Arachidonic acid converted by COX-2 leads to prostaglandins, which are mainly responsible for inflammation. With this baseline knowledge, it will make it easier to understand how the NSAIDs and Tylenol work. So as we just discussed, these are the effects when arachidonic goes through COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. So now what happens when NSAIDs inhibit these enzymes? Well, traditional NSAIDs are non-selective, so they inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2 enzyme. COX-1 inhibition leads to anti-inflammatory properties, antipyretic, analgesic properties, GI ulcers, unfortunately, and antiplatelet properties. And COX-2 inhibition leads to anti-inflammatory properties, antipyretic, and analgesic properties. Now, there are also selective COX-2 inhibitors like Celebrex. The selling point for these agents when it was released is that since they do not inhibit COX-2, COX-1 enzyme, they will not have the risk of the gastric ulcers. Now, the mechanism of Tylenol is very similar to the NSAIDs. So depending on the source you check, Tylenol's mechanism is sometimes listed as unknown. Many studies have also shown that it inhibits COX-1 and COX-2 in the CNS, and this leads to antipyretic and analgesic effects. Please keep in mind that it does not inhibit COX-1 and 2 in the periphery, so therefore it's not considered as an anti-inflammatory agent. Now that we understand your mechanism, let's discuss when you would use these agents. If you are enjoying this video so far, please hit the like button and subscribe also. It costs $0 and it takes one second. Thank you. Now we use these agents for three main things, inflammation, fever, and pain. If there is inflammation like swelling, redness, and itching, you would use the NSAIDs. Tylenol does not have this effect in the peripheral tissues. For fever, you could use Tylenol or NSAIDs. Research suggests that Tylenol and ibuprofen have similar effects in controlling fevers, so pick what's best for you. Now they're both good for mild to moderate pain, but it depends on the type of pain. Tylenol is great for headaches, and other minor aches and pains. NSAIDs are used for headaches, menstrual cramps, muscle strains and sprains, and also pain due to inflammation like arthritis. Just like any medication, these agents come with their side effects also. So Tylenol is harmless at low doses, but Tylenol can cause hepatotoxicity when overdosed, and there are evidence out there suggesting that it can even cause a transient increase in the liver enzymes. 
and in rare cases, it could lead to serious skin toxicities such as rash and blisters. Now, NSAIDs can lead to acute renal toxicity because of its inhibition of production of prostaglandins, which normally causes vasodilation in the kidneys to increase blood flow to it. So when you inhibit it, you reduce the amount of blood that reaches the kidney. These agents may also cause stomach upset and even more severe stomach ulcers and GI bleeds. This is due to the inhibition of COX-1, which normally helps protect the stomach lining. Now for minor GI upset, taking it with food may help, but it also decreases its onset of action, which may be a significant thing when you're seeking pain relief right away. Now since NSAIDs have antiplatelet effects, they should be avoided in people with pre-existing platelet defects or thrombocytopenia. Now although the benefit of low-dose aspirin and cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease is well established. The use of other NSAIDs is associated with increased cardiovascular toxicities, which I will discuss a little more next. So here we have three types of NSAIDs, the non-selectives, the COX-2 selectives, and the irreversible non-selective agents. In terms of cardiovascular risk, we think of the non-selectives and the COX-2 selectives, but the irreversible non-selective are cardioprotective. So let's look at the mechanism to get a better understanding. COX-1 and 2 normally produce prostaglandins, which would then produce prostacyclin. Prostacyclin is a potent vasodilator that reduces blood pressure. So these agents have the cardiovascular risk because they inhibit this and therefore no production of prostacyclin, which normally reduces blood pressure, but these agents also have that antiplatelet effect from COX-1 inhibition because remember you also make thromboxane when arachidonic acid gets converted to prostaglandins through the COX-1. Thromboxane normally promotes platelet activation. Because of this phenomenon, the non-selectives may have a lower cardiovascular risk compared to the COX-2 selectives, which inhibits the COX-2 enzyme. Now, because there is no COX-1 inhibition, there will be no inhibition of the formation of thromboxane, which promotes platelet activation and will put patients at a higher risk for cardiovascular or cerebrovascular events. For the irreversible non-selective NSAIDs like aspirin, here is the mechanism. Same as the regular non-selectives, only difference is that it binds irreversibly. And research has shown that 90% COX-1 inhibition is needed for a significant antiplatelet effect, which is achieved with the irreversible binding. Lastly, let's look at some clinical pearls of these agents. Tylenol is found in multiple over-the-counter cough and cold brands. So because of this, overdoses do happen. Sometimes it's because the patient did not know that they were taking the same drugs. If possible, the pharmacist must educate patients on this when they're using Tylenol. Inform the patient that they have to always look at the ingredients on the medication label for acetaminophen. Tylenol is also usually the preferred pain reliever and fever reducer for pregnant women. Now, the maximum daily dose ranges from 3 to 4 grams. Naproxen was observed to have the least risk among the other NSAIDs for cardiovascular-related events and death. NSAIDs can also interact with a lot of drugs that are renally cleared because of the ability to reduce the blood flow to the kidneys. So a good example is the interaction with lithium. Lastly, we have the maximum daily dose, which is 1.2 grams for over-the-counter and 3.2 grams when it's a prescription. And that will be the end of this video. Hopefully that was straightforward, straight to the point, and I'm sure you learned so many things. And now it's clear to you when you will use one agent versus the other. And I hope the mechanism was able to make it easier for you to understand why we do this and also the side effects associated with these agents. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button, subscribe and leave a comment down below. And also follow me on my Instagram at Pharmacist Academy. Thank you for watching this video and take care.